Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this presentation and Q&A session for the St Kilda Marina, which is one of our most significant projects ever undertaken by Council. And I want to start by respectfully acknowledging the Yalakut Willem clan of the Boon Wurrung. We pay our respect to their elders, both past and present, and we acknowledge and uphold their continuing relationship to this land. I'm Jo McNeil, the Executive Manager of Property and Assets, the team responsible for this project, and I'll be your MC for this session, which will, which will finish at 12.30 p.m. Uh, we were hoping to have an in-person session today, but unfortunately we've had to go online, but fortunately we've been able to continue anyway. And we've got today joining us councillors Marcus Pearl, Heather Consolo, and councillor Andrew Bond. We'll be recording this session today and posting it on your, our Have Your Say page for those who weren't able to make it today. We last communicated with you in a public forum about the future of the site in July last year, after COP announced the proposed tenant and the key terms for the St Kilda Marina new lease. And that was following a complex and long procurement process. We introduced the new, the proposed tenant, Australia Marina Development Corporation, AMDC, as we refer to them, presented the concept plans for the site and provided the opportunity for questions and answers. Since then, following a submissions process for the proposed lease, council formally approved the new lease and its submission to the council, to the state government, I should say, for approval. So the new lease was formally approved by state government on the 1st of December last year and executed by COP and AMDC later in December 2020. Today is a chance for you to learn more about the concept design and provide feedback to the new tenant who will use this information to inform the detailed design part of uh, this process moving into the planning process. Uh, the purpose of the session specifically today is to meet or reacquaint yourself with the new tenant, to take you through in detail the concept design for the redevelopment that was previously public released, publicly released uh, as part of the online Q&A session in July last year, to provide a forum for your questions, and you can please post your questions anytime into the Q&A chat forum throughout the session, and we'll go through them with our panel after the presentation. And in doing so, it is hoped that you'll feel sufficiently informed to complete the Have You Say survey that is live until 4th of July uh, to provide your feedback on various elements of the design and the use of the site. The information that we receive from the survey will be used by AMDC to inform their detailed design leading into the planning process. I'm going to start by summarising the various stages of the project that we have worked through to get to this point, and we'll spend a bit of time taking you through the stage that we're currently in. I'll then hand over to John Edgeley, the CEO of AMDC, before we move into the Q&A part of the session. But please, as I said, start posting your questions anytime as you think of them, and we'll get through as many as we can, and we'll post the answers to any that we don't get to today on the Have Your Say page. Okay, so as you can see, there's been a number of stages to this project, starting quite a while ago, um, about four years ago. And the first stage was developing the how. So how do we go about this complex project to make sure we set it up for success? The second stage was working through the why. What, what do we want to achieve for the site? What are the things that the public, the community, the broader, broader community who use the marina from all over Victoria and state government? What are, what's the vision and objectives that will guide the rest of the project? Stage three was about setting the what translating the objectives into specific design parameters that can be used then to inform the development of a concept plan. Stage four was getting ready for the procurement of a new long-term lease, getting ready and then going out for, uh, to the market for a, a new long-term lease. Stage five was working through that procurement process, um, selecting the who, who will be the new tenant for the, for the next however long that the lease was going to be, and working through the, the approvals process. And stage five then led into stage six, which we're in right now, which is, which is great to be at this stage of the project. And this includes a number of activities, including working with AMGC and uh, the, the current tenant on a smooth transition to the new lease. And we really appreciate the collaborative approach of the current tenant, Australian Marinas, in working with council and AMGC through the transition process undertaking a site contamination assessment to, undertake, to determine a remediation and management plan for the site, and working with state government bodies, which includes 
develop and Parks Vic, who, who will have input into the redevelopment and areas of the new lease. Working with the tenant to prepare for landlord approval of the design documents, which is planned for later this year and the lead up to the planning approval process. And today, the engagement process, which is underway. So extensive consultation, including input from the community panel, has been invaluable in developing the site vision and objectives for the St Kilda Marina, uh, which was then uh, developed into a site brief. And the, as you can see, the, there's been significant input from the community over various stages. And the reason for the really significant upfront consultation with the community was that we wanted to make sure that the vision and objectives were really clear. What were the outcomes that we wanted to receive, to achieve for the site that would then lead into the more detailed planning that we're in, that we're entering into today. Uh, and as part of this consultation, um, getting into the finer detail of the site rather than the big chunks which we've dealt with uh, in the site brief, which uh, determined the design parameters for the site. So as you can see, there's been quite a lot of opportunities in the past for consultation and, and that's leading into this consultation today, which is uh, hopefully informed by all of the information that's been developed in the past. And we encourage you to, as part of your um, working through the, the online survey, have a look at these past documents, uh, particularly the lease summary, which provides a summary of all of the key terms of the, the new long-term lease. Okay, in the design for the site provides an inviting place for everyone to enjoy, whether it's relaxing, enjoying the view while having a bite to eat, a drink or boating or exercising and accessibility, uh, far more open space, uh, a new revitalised retail strip, more and better bike and pedestrian paths and a world-class working marina. We believe all these elements raised during consultations are reflected in the proposed designs. And as you can see, what came out of that first part of the setting of the vision and objectives was really clear outcomes under place identity, social and cultural, economic, environment and financial. And the way the lease is set up is to deliver on all of those things. And so as you read through the key lease terms, you'll see references to all of these outcomes. And uh, it's exciting to see that it will be very exciting to see as the, 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 the redevelopment occurs and the site becomes refreshed, all of these outcomes will start to be delivered. And so to support the delivery of the design criteria and the, the, the vision and objectives, which we just saw on the screen, a planning scheme amendment was undertaken and gazetted in December last year. As part of the planning process for the project, we wanted to provide an opportunity for the community to provide feedback on the look and functionality of elements of the concept design. So while the, while the concept design has been approved and is in place, we're now, there's now an opportunity to provide input into some of the elements of the site, particularly the look and feel. What is it that you want to be doing when you're at the site? Where do you want to be sitting? Where would you like some shade? Where would you like to have amenities like barbecues? Um, other things that you can think of that will really contribute to how the site functions over time. So as that's, that's basically why we're consulting at the moment. It's uh, an opportunity for the community to provide feedback on those functionality and the look and feel elements of the concept design. And the Have Your Say page provides more information around each of those parts of the, the site and uh, asks you questions to help prompt some input from you. So I really encourage you to go on uh, line if you haven't already and start filling that in. We've developed a have your say as I said and included in that is a narrated slider and a series of questions and it can and that engagement and the opportunity to contribute concludes on the 4th of July. So what I'd like to now do is introduce John Edgley from Australian Marina Development Corporation AMDC who's the CEO and uh, he's going to take you through a bit more information. So welcome, John. We're up and running. Thanks, Joe. Good morning, everyone. I'm coming to you from a beautiful evening at the new marina in the background. I'm the CEO for AMDC and I've been running AMDC's interest in the marina since we submitted the RFP process at the end of 2019. Been working very closely with the city. We've got a great working relationship between us and working towards takeover of the lease on May 1st and uh, 
making everything come to life. I've also got David Heffernan um, on the panel with me here. David's the chairman of AMDC. He represents one of the three Melbourne families that are backing AMDC, all of which are very hands-on involved in the development program, the work with the council and the creation of this new space. David's the CEO and co-founder of a multinational company that uh, one of the interests is the largest marina construction business in the Middle East. So he's no stranger to boating and together with Sharon Bartlett, um, another one of our owners, probably one of the best uh, uh, couples associated with waterfront placemaking in the world. So we're in good hands in terms of experience in creating this place and making it something really incredible for everyone. Like David, all the owners of AMDC, their local families, they're involved and, and have a long-term love affair with the marina and really want to um, make sure that this becomes something really special. So as part of the community engagement, we've worked with the city to put together a fly-through that's going to be played for you in, um, in a couple of minutes when I'm done. Please keep in mind, look, the fly-through captures a lot of what we're intending to do with the site, what aspirationally want to, we want to have happen with the site, reflects the conversations we've had with the city and it really sets up the baseline to get the feedback and input from the people here today and for anyone that's want, willing and able to contribute to this process over the, um, over the coming weeks and give us the feedback that we need to refine all the elements to make sure that it's a great experience for everyone. One of the biggest questions we keep getting asked is about the timing, when, when are things going to happen? We're working as hard and as fast as we can on the planning and permitting stage right now. We take over the site on the 1st of May. We intend and we hope by the end of next year to actually break ground on doing the transformation. And with the wind at our back, we think we can really work through that in under two years. I mean, that's certainly what we're doing all our planning towards. The world brings up things that will get in our way and maybe delay us. And probably imagine a couple of them that we've been experiencing real, real time right now. But, but um, that's certainly what we intend to do. And, and really our primary focus through all of that is to make sure that the marina stays functioning, that the public boat ramp stays open for everyone to be able to use it, that the wet berths and the dry berths still remain functional and that we're working very hard on a transition plan to make that, <coughs> excuse me, as seamless as possible. So we've got a great team that has experience with transitions like this and, um, you know, there, there'll be a lot of anxiety out there with our current customers of the marina that we're going to work very hard to manage. So we've started our communications. We are very customer focused, customer first. There's a little bit of crawling we've got to do before we can walk and run in terms of Privacy Act and getting permission to talk to the current customers of the marina. We've started that outreach. We've got about a third of the customers have signed up with us to receive communications and we're taking baby steps towards that. And over the next few months, you'll see more and more communication from us as we get from the from the introductory um, discussions into the real issues and the commercial issues and the um, fun and engagement of uh, the transformation. So if you haven't had a chance to connect with us yet, please do. Um, and certainly over the next uh, few months, our efforts will extend beyond customers into the new and the current tenants, into the general public and working with the city on the programming and the events and certainly integrating any of the feedback we get from this process. So we've got an incredible comms team at Creative Factory, another local business that are managing all of that for us that we talk to on a daily basis where um, we've got events that we're planning uh, that are coming out. We've got a, a very good working relationship with the current marina operators and we're talking to them on a weekly basis. And we really look forward to seeing everyone down there and, and being part of transforming this incredible site. Um, I'll hand over I think because the key thing we want to do is hear from hear from questions. David and I are ready to uh, address almost anything that you throw at us. I'll hand over to Sarah. She'll get the fly through going as a little bit of a um, a teaser and some inspiration, give you a chance to compile some thoughts and get them through on the chat, and uh, and we'll take your questions. Thanks.
the St Kilda Marina will have a new lease commencing in May next year. The tenant and developer is the Australian Marina Development Corporation. With the new lease, a redevelopment of the marina will commence creating a destination for everyone. The planned improvements include a diverse mix of boutique retail, restaurants and cafes, state-of-the-art boating facilities, and we'll see an increase in public open space from 4% to 50%, as well as an increase in sustainability features across the marina. The existing hard stand boat storage will be removed, opening up the peninsula for public recreation, including a wider promenade, leading to the tip of the peninsula, providing awe-inspiring views across the bay. A new civic heart will welcome people to congregate for activities or quiet contemplation. New translucent boat storage will display the theatre of the marina and provide views of the harbour and bay. A modernised indoor and outdoor anchor hospitality venue will invite people into the newly accessible peninsula. The Beacon, a St Kilda icon, will be restored and enhanced with parkland. The much-loved skydiving activity will continue. The marina's main entry will significantly improve access for cars, boats, pedestrians and cyclists. An upgraded petrol station will remain with improved offerings for up to 10 years. A re-diversion of the Bay Trail from the marina to Moran Reserve will avoid conflict points at the boat ramp. The harbour will undergo considerable change, including reorientation to free up marina parade for public space. Reorganisation will allow super yachts and smaller vessels to use the harbour. The popular public boat ramp will include improvements for launch and retrieval. A boat fueling facility will cater for all boats accessing the harbour. The Coast Guard will be homed in a new facility overlooking the waters. Spaces will be provided for use by community organisations. Reimagined car parking will provide opportunities for other exciting uses, such as events and activities in the cooler months. Help us shape the future of St Kilda Marina. Visit haveyoursay.portphillip.vic.gov.au Thank you, John, and great to see that fly through. And thank you to everybody who's already posted questions. We'll start reading those out. I'd just like to welcome Councillor Sirikov, who, who has also joined us this morning. Uh, so I'll do my best to summarise the questions and then I'll hand over to the panel member that I think uh, might be able to start the answer and then uh, if anybody else would like to uh, contribute to that in the panel, um, we will also pass over to you. So the first question is about the market rental uh, and noting that the council will, will now receive an, uh, a market rent that's different to what it was receiving uh, and uh, which is about 750,000 um, per, per annum. Uh, and correctly, the question does state that um, council is not free to treat this rental as uh, part of general revenue. There's a requirement under the St Kilda Land Act that requires us to spend the income very specifically. Uh, and the Act specifically says that you must spend, council must spend the revenue around the, the marina to support the marina. Uh, and so the question is around uh, whether council will uh, put some of that, uh, and specifically the question says 100,000 for the first four years um, towards the building of a bridge in future, which uh, for those who are new to the project, uh, a bridge that links the Bay Trail from one side of um, from the mouth of the marina, having a bridge over that, uh, was something that was uh, discussed very, very in much detail and there's quite a lot of passion on both sides around the bridge. Um, the current lease allows for a bridge to occur in future, uh, but it's something that council will need to contemplate in future. And so uh, I will answer that question. So I've just confirmed, as I've said, that the Act does state that council needs to spend that money in a particular way. What we're doing at the moment is working with state government um, to clarify um, the future spending to make sure that there's a, a framework for both spending and reporting over the next 50 years. And um, 
and it will include the opportunity to invest in a bridge in future if a future council decides that that's something that is worthwhile doing. Um, it will also include uh, investment in new uh, renewal of existing assets, upgrade and maintenance of assets around the marina and along the foreshore, uh, supporting foreshore use uh, as well as around the marina. And uh, that will be really important for supporting the con connectivity across the whole of the foreshore. So the second question that we've received is about the boats on trailers currently kept at the marina. And the question is, will they have space to be kept while the marina is being developed? So I might hand over to John to answer that one. Boats on trailers. Welcome everyone. Thanks for that question, Joe. So the new layout of the marina, as everyone is now well aware, removes the hard stand that goes out on the peninsula in preference for open public space. And, um, and so the question about capacity, which isn't an exact answer yet, but the capacity that we have that we're installing is 300 boats in a dry stack and um, 70 or 80 spots in the wet berth so that we're complying with the Australian standards when we redo the layout of the marina basin and the elimination of hard stand for the parking of trailers and trailer boats. Within the operation of the marina, we'll have a program in place to do a number of things that help make that transformation less painful. So working with uh, our customers on what to do with their trailers when the boats are in the dry stack, storing them either on site or off site, a program to manage that. Uh, in terms of providing facility for, particularly for mast up trailer sailors, there is um, the way that the technology is being implemented for the car parking will mean that there can be multiple cycles around that mean you don't have to pay to go in and out of boom gates to be able to take extra time to step the mast and rig, rig the boats. I mean, that's not uh, the perfect scenario that's been in existence for the last couple of decades, but the, but the ability to have um, the uh, uh, Mast Up Trailer Sailor Club use facilities on site, which is part of our agreement with the city around providing community facilities. The ability to be able to use, I think in an easier stand, the way that the uh, car park flows for managing. And certainly in the transition or the time between when we take over and when we start the works under the planning and permitting um, program, there will be a number of months, I suspect, uh, where we can manage that transition. So, so there's no long-term parking for boats on trailers anymore in the marina, and that's part of the trade-off between consolidating the fenced-in area to a very small footprint and liberating 50% of the space for the public and um, the ability to continue to maintain. There, there is the ability, of course, for, for um, sailing boats to be berthed in the, um, in the wet berths and um, the ability to look at being able to store them in the dry stack, but I know that's not really the, the preferred option for, for that group. So we'll work with them on transitioning um, as best we can within the constraints that we've got with the site. Um, and maybe, uh, Joe, one of your team might want to address uh, anything if I've missed something there. Great, thanks, John. We might uh, keep going and um we can uh, come back to that question if anybody else has got anything further to add. Uh, so the next question is about the civic heart and uh, we have a, a, a suggestion for the civic heart about adding a children's playground featuring a replica of the Lady of St Kilda, uh, which is a ship uh, after which, this, which St Kilda was named, uh, which is interesting to know and uh, seems to be appropriate to the marina from the person who posed the question. Uh, it could be like uh, the very popular ship at the end of North Road that always has kids and family around it. So for those of you who know that one. Uh, and the, the question also includes that there could be, or proposal, that there could be two plaques, one explaining the history of the name St Kilda and the other history of the marina. Uh, so I might um, ask David, maybe if you could talk in general about the purpose of the Civic Heart and activation, and then maybe uh, John, you could respond to the specific question about the playground. 
sure. Thanks, Joe. Um, great question. Look, the whole Civic Heart, as you know, and, and we've mentioned before, now 50% of public ground, but that Civic Heart area, we're still working with our architects and internally um, looking at what, you know, what, what is the best way to activate that and, and for the public and to be able to go down there and really experience something special. So um, at this stage, uh, the area in terms of the sheer volume of the areas outlined in our in our proposal, but we're still uh, looking at, at everything. I mean, the ship sounds a terrific idea, but we just need to really look at everything while we're putting all that together and working with the team that what's the best use of it. So um, without giving you a specific answer to that, I'd love to go down and have a look at that ship and understand what they're doing. And maybe next time we're down there, it'd be great to meet face to face and discuss it. Thank you, David. John, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, th I think the other part of the programming for the site, we've got we've got quite a lot of work going on with the city in terms of making sure that the interface with the with the parks and the facilities that are provided on Marine Reserve and also the plans for Moran Reserve and working out the best way to attract and, and keep families and really make the site much more family friendly than it was. So the Centre for Boating adding in their um, family rooms, the ability across the site for for there to be things to do that's, so this is not explicitly addressing the idea of how you tie back to the history and heritage of the Lady of St Kilda, but, but, but it's um, you know, part of this feedback process and people need to get online and put in their ideas so that we can consider everything, um, making sure that we understand what it is that would bring people down there, what would make them stay for the day, what would get them out to the beacon and out and the beacon park and the promenade, what would make them stay and be comfortable in the Civic Heart? How do we tie that into programming with um, St Kilda Festival, with open air events, with relaxation space and contemplation space, and tie into the, you know, some of the original roots of the area with with um, artists and and art and and sort of culture, and and I think all of those things are what we're trying to balance with our design team internally and with the team at uh, the city when we digest the feedback that we get from this whole process. But but I think the outcome is going to be amazing. Um, the outcome will be incredible and it will really be a place for everyone to come and enjoy something very special. And um, you know, I think the idea is a great one. We have to work out how that fits in and, and exactly where it might be, because we've got so much more space than just the Civic Heart to do things here that are, that are for the public and for families and for children. And, in a way that we've never had before. So um, I think it's a great idea and I think we should, the more people can feed these things in, the, the better options we'll have in front of us as we refine the engagement of the space. Thank you, John. And uh, I'll just put a plug in for the Have You Say page uh, following that question. There's a specific question that relates to the Civic Heart and we'd love to hear your suggestions uh, and what you would like to have that space do for you in, and um, it really is an opportunity right now to contribute to that. So the next question is about the a lookout tower and we've got a suggestion for incorporating a lookout tower either in the renovated beacon or a replacement beacon that would take advantage of the peninsula being opened up to the public and enable the public to enjoy the best views of Port Phillip Bay. I completely agree with that, it is an amazing view uh, and uh, yeah, before or after enjoying a coffee and a cake at the nearby kiosk. Great suggestion. So I might hand over to John and then maybe Shelley, you could also talk about uh, any planning um, uh, related things that need to be thought about in relation to that idea. So over to you, John, first. It's like someone's been reading the um, reading the, the cheat notes, Joe. The, uh, and I keep looking, it's hard to know. There's my camera here where the audience is, but you're up over here on the side of my screen. so. A um, you know a COVID pass on on eye contact, but the uh, the 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 beacon is very special. In fact, it does have a, a ladder and access through the windows up there, but um, surprisingly tight. Uh, not really observation uh, deck space, but what we have been discussing is the ability to have an observation platform at the northern end of the um, of that dry stack building on the top of the centre for boating, which. You know, I think as people get to see the site, even standing at ground level, the views and the um, you know the vista from that Beacon Park are, are stunning. I would say they're the best in the city. The views that you have across the bay and into the CBD and down the St Kilda foreshore are absolutely incredible. And 
just having those accessible to people will be amazing. But um, but putting an observation deck on the, on the northern end of that building is something that we're certainly working through and and is tied in with the planning for missions and the refinement of the design and the way that we put it forward. But, but we agree that that is a fantastic idea. Thank you, John. Shelley, do you have anything to add to that from a planning perspective? Just the only thing to add is that the, the beacon is actually subject to a heritage overlay, so that will need to be um, taken into account with all of the works that happen and, and the planning controls really protect for the views to the beacon as well um, and across the site more broadly. So, so I think what John's talking about sounds great from a planning point of view as well and, and it's just there's a bit of a balance that needs to happen there with the different elements on the site. Thank you, Shelley. So the next question that's been posted is about the Bay Trail and uh, the comment includes that they, the person doesn't feel that the, the proposed Bay Trail, which does, is realigned um, somewhat in this um, concept plan, does not remove all of the existing conflict points between cars and pedestrians and uh, with the most dangerous one where cars enter the service station and bikes re reach the footpath on Marine Pat Parade <laughs> and the proposed Bay Trail. Uh, they, yeah, obviously um, the person who's posted this feels very strongly about it being a tragedy waiting to happen. So um, what I might ask is, well, the question is, should a new route for the Bay Trail um, that directly connects the existing trail in Moran Reserve with the new route at the back of the service station. Um, so I might ask Shelley if you're best placed to answer the question about how what we've um, attempted to do with the Bay Trail and the conflict points that are still there and how they might be managed and the idea of uh, a new route that directly connects the existing trail in Moran Reserve with the new route at the back of the service station. Um, so the planning controls, uh, which are based on the site brief that was initially developed, and it is looking at trying to reduce as much as possible conflict points on the, the Bay Trail. And, and in the controls and in the site brief, um, they show the relocation of, of that along Marine Parade. There is still the one conflict point where the entry to the marina is for vehicles um, from Marine Parade, and that will need to be managed um, through the design of that and there's a number of requirements in the planning controls about about showing that and, and doing um, you know transport and traffic studies to make sure that that is manageable. Um, it, it also does show linking um, the the Bay Trail from Marine Parade through Moran Reserve as well. Um, and eventually, if if the bridge does, um, if council decides to proceed with the bridge, then then it could link in that way as well. So it would be kind of a secondary option for for riding, bike riding along that or, and walking along that space. Thank you, Shelley. And I know that the Bay Trail and the problems that the Bay Trail currently have is one of the things that was uh, where people were most aligned in um, acknowledging the need to resolve those issues. And one of the things that became obvious through uh, the, all of the discussions about how the site could be redeveloped was that you can't get rid of every single conflict point um, because there are, are different users across the site. But what you can do is uh, minimise them and then put in management of the site that really addresses that. And uh, maybe uh, David or John, you could talk about that kind of management perspective of in future, how you'll be building that in. Joe, I think the the refinement of the system that we have for managing that single point across the across the road. I mean, the the advantage is that we're managing the bulk of the traffic flow from the bike path across a single point, rather than uh, where it goes across right now to the still controlled but relative chaos of the boat ramp, which is four boats wide, and in, certainly in the deepest season, you've got cars backing up, you've got your boats being deployed, you've got boats coming out, it really is, there's a lot more going on there. And to maintain it around a fixed traffic point that's well understood with um, with operating lights, cleans up um, every conflict point. There, there, there may still be something at the back where cars go through the back of the um, service station to get over into the into the car park. We haven't resolved yet, as Shelley said, we've got the We've got quite a bit of work to do still with the traffic flow and the traffic 
strategic management plan to really finalize how we make sure those points are as safe as possible. What we do know is the solution we've got now is it is a lot cleaner and simpler to manage than um, it is currently. And that, um, that the signage, the wayfinding program and the um, sort of where we put hard barriers versus landscape barriers all plays into the deep thinking we're doing now about finalizing the master plan. And I think you know that's a that's a work in progress between between your team and our team, and and you know we are one team effectively. And, but but there's um, there's a bit of work to do to make sure it's as good as it can be, given the constraints that we've got. I think the key part here is though making sure that we're committed we're committed to moving the bike path behind the fuel station, so we don't have conflict coming off Marine Parade going into and out of the fuel station, which is one of the busiest points on the on along this stretch of road for, um, you know, there's not that many fuel stations left. And I think that's where some of the danger will be eliminated. Thank you, John. Uh, and I think it is also important, Shelley touched on it, that if there if there is a bridge in future, um, the idea is that the Bay Trail would be duplicated. So it would go along Marine Parade and it would also then go along the peninsula linked by the bridge. and. Uh, one would um, accommodate probably the faster commuter people who are just uh, intent on moving through the site and then the, 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 the one that goes along the peninsula would be a more meandering shared path experience. So that's, that's um, linked to that future idea of a, a bridge. So the next question is around a, a members area and uh, um, support for the principle of a members area. Uh, and that, that it's a feature of yacht clubs that is missing in many marinas and uh, that uh, the idea is that a membership should be available to the general public. So that, uh, putting that uh, idea out there. Uh, David, did you want to talk to that one? Yes, more than happy to. Um, we've looked at what's been very successful in a lot of different marinas, not just in Australia, but, and we're also benchmarking everything around Australia, but certainly overseas. And it's it's obviously critical for us, um, again, wanting to, you know, establish straight away a five anchor marina environmentally, both, you know, community based and everything else. So we're putting in a members area that will have a lot of different facilities that um, that people don't have uh, currently in in, in a lot of marinas around Australia. I think we've found one, but, you know, back of house laundry facilities, um, nice areas, um, you know, to, to casual sit down and gathering areas. So, you know, possibility of looking at fitness areas for it. So we're gonna have a, a definitely a members area uh, in in the northern end of the of the of the dry stack as we've discussed. We're we're also looking at some other options um, for general public areas. And and again, John mentioned briefly before uh, we're looking at, you know, whether it be access point uh, where we could have lookout tower and other things and areas that they could, you know, they could access like a lot of them. So uh, we're, we're spending a lot of time, um, uh, all of us, the team working together on what 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 is it that people really want, not just from boat owners, you know, people that want to visit as well. So we feel we're, we're uh, getting very close of uh, articulating exactly that plan. So. Um, more than happy uh, on the next session again. Hopefully, we're all face to face that uh, we could show you some of the ideas that we're looking at, and, and again, what what's currently offered um, in Australia. And we're, we're obviously we're going to be uh, at a different level of offering for everyone. So uh, it's yeah, very exciting for the site. Thank you, David. So we we've run out of questions for the moment. Um, so while we're waiting for a few more questions, I might ask Shelley or Felicity if you could uh, maybe take us through what the the planning process is from here, uh, which might prompt and what what the uh, the process um, moving from detailed design into um, submitting for for planning permits, etc. And that might prompt some more questions. Shall we? Yeah, I was just waiting to see if Felicity was going to answer. <laughs> so we've got a um, we've got a two stage planning approval process from here. So the first the first part of it is the approval of the development plan, which is kind of like the overall master plan for the site, um, and then the second stage is the planning permits themselves, um, and so. 
there's a range of different requirements for each of those stages um, that range into quite detailed technical reports, uh, things like the traffic management that John mentioned before, also looking at um, some of the environmental um, issues on the side, you know, wave action plans and things like that. Um, also just, you know, providing all of the details on the uses on the site, how it's going to be designed, the public realm. Um, there's a real range of, of reports that are required to really just kind of go into that detail and make sure that everything works together and meets all the objectives and the vision for the site. Um, I think that's it kind of as a high level. Is there more kind of detail you wanted, Michelle? I might just oh, sorry, Joe. Really? Yeah, oh. or, or yeah. Um, the all the documentation that's required to be submitted to council through the development plan is outlined in the development plan overlay, which is on council's website. Great, thank you, Shelley and Felicity. So I might ask. John and David, uh, and maybe we can go to the slide that shows the layout of the site. I'm really interested. I think there's an opportunity for you to share what the types of things are that you're looking for. What would you like to hear from people as they're, they're um, filling in the Have You Say page? What are the types of things that would be useful for you to know about, like what people would like to be doing on site or where they'd like to be sitting? What are the types of things that would really help you in the, in the next stage of detailed planning. So maybe uh, John and then David. Yeah, sure. Th thanks, Joe. Look, the, the site is, um, there's such a big transformation that's uh, going to happen with the liberation of all this space and the creation of all these public spaces, everything from the suggestion about the observation deck and the, um, uh, and the kiosk at the end of the peninsula walk. But there, there's, 500 metres of uh, shoreline there that, that will be providing facility um, for people, whether it's just strolling along and enjoying the views or whether it's stopping and sitting. And the traditional way that you might do that is uh, with a picnic table and a coin operated barbecue um, and uh, a couple of bench seats. Well, we're looking for something a lot more impactful than that and a lot more engaging than that. So everything from community groups that are looking for a home for their monthly meetings and the sorts of things that they might do that could be associated with the site, like maybe nippers or um, the Coast Guard are based there, the sorts of things that the Coast Guard are, are talking about. And David and I have met with the um, current commander and the new commander coming in to talk about the sorts of programs that in the past they've been isolated behind a high, you know, a high chain wire fence in the new layout, they're going to be available to the public. I mean, it's a fantastic service, right? To have an emergency service located there, housed within our facility with all their training, their capability, just as a visiting place for kids to come down and really see what volunteers are doing. Um, what uh, what the artists might like, I mean, I've, uh, I hadn't really been thinking about it, but one of the things that came up when we were doing some of the early conversations was instead of a picnic table, what about an outdoor art studio where someone can come and set up their easel? What do they need out there? We've got we've got the um, wonderful luxury of, of redoing this marina in an age where Wi-Fi and digital technology mean that we can have uh, the site will be 100% solar powered. So we have the ability to tap into a totally green energy solution to provide charging stations at various points around the site to provide metered stations that have different power points to tie into, utilities to tie into. I mean, if you're out there and listening, what can you do with the site? What what uh, what does your food truck need to hook up to? What other of these, you know, every, every week you see someone coming up, especially post COVID with a brilliant idea for a mobile contained solution of something, right? A service for for a dog washing in a trailer that might tie in with the new dog walking area over in uh, Moran Reserve. The, setting up an outdoor drive-in for special events for outdoor movies, having a having a um, three on three pickup game area in the transformable car park, uh, winter ice skating. I mean, this is a, this is a, the site will be available unlike ever before for anyone out there with a great idea to work with us and to work with the city about how they can program something that really brings people down to either tie into an existing event or to start a whole new event 
we've we've had someone talking to us about the World High Diving Championships that could be located just offshore here and tie in and you know they bring in hundreds of thousands of people from around the world and and massive TV viewership. I mean that's a big idea, but we're after everything from big ideas to small ideas. Um, and and while within our team we've got tremendous reach to be able to think about. Um, what's out there and what's available and come up with something. But often those really unique ideas that truly tie into the community come from within the community. So that's what we, re I mean, we're really hoping to get some some um, fantastic feedback and, and ideas from this program that, that uh, elevates everything we're offering and really lets people understand that this site is for everyone, right? This site is, is opened up like never before. It's a, it's a sensational piece of property. It's, it's for boaters and we're dramatically improving what we're going to do for boaters, what we're offering for boaters, the scale of boats that can be both indoors and outdoors, um, everything to do with the water, but getting people that don't have boats on the water's edge, sitting as close to the water as they can be, enjoying the theatre of the boating. Um, what do you need to do that? What do you need if you want to plug in your um, your PA and do a do a you know a makeup session, an open mic session out there in the Civic Heart in the middle of uh, summer? What do you need to be out on the peninsula? What will it get you out there with your kids to enjoy um, the foreshore there? Maybe what we can do with the beach area. What is it? What do you need to be able to clean up afterwards? What are the best family facilities you've seen to help you manage your children and you know, your um, Cleaning up after a day, either on the water or just in uh, enjoying the place. Is it a is it a playground? Another playground? Is it a something else? Right? Is it a an outdoor cleaning facility? Is it a? I don't know. I can't imagine what it is people need, but we want to hear from them and we want to hear what those things are. Well said, John. <laughs> I think you covered everything. I think one of our main goals we've always been saying is when you wake up on Saturday morning. And you think, what do we want to do? We want to go to St Kilda Marina, make it that real destinational, uh, fun place that you know that everyone wants to be at. And I think that's right, John. Any anyone who's got any great suggestions, even you know non-seasonal. Some of those winter days are pretty bad down there, but we still want to have activities or something that you know there could be uh, great that families and boat people, boat owners, or whatever it be, you know, uh, wants to be able to do in, in on those cold days as well. So I agree, John. We welcome anyone's thoughts on uh, great ideas to activate that area and. I think it's uh, terrific. So please send as many of those ideas in. It'd be great. We'd, we'll welcome that. Thank you, David and John. So I've had a few more questions come in. One about uh, which consultants prepared the concept design for the architecture and landscape. John? Yeah, I can answer that. So um, uh, Jackson, Clement Burroughs, JCB Architects, also very familiar to the city who are doing the um, St Kilda uh, Pier redevelopment with um, Parks Vic um, and AW Maritime. They prepared the master plan and the um, and worked with us through the concept plan and submission and Aspect uh, Studios, also prominent in the area, um, were involved in really doing the baseline for the landscape layout. Thanks, John. So the next question I think is probably also for you. Uh, and it's around the, the area that's currently used for storage of trailered uh, boats and uh, which obviously as you can see in the, the, the concept that's on the screen for everybody that's now been turned into a, a public park area. Um, so the question is where do we not now store our boats? So, the, so the, the dry stack has capacity for 300 boats. And um, and the boats that are currently on the hard stand have the opportunity to move into that dry stack. I mean, there's a there's a the commercials of running the marina is uh, is around contracts for those storage, but there's no hard stand storage at all on the site anymore. And I know that's a fundamental shift. That's the trade off I mentioned earlier between liberating all that space and making it available for people. Um, the trail is also, so we haven't resolved the final answer on that, but within the dry stack, you know, there's space for trailers, either stacked on a uh, place for a boat. I mean, we're getting into the mechanics of how we operate a dry stack, but um, whether they're stored on site or off site, and again, that'll be choices that people have about what they do with the trailer that the boat comes on, a very specific one. Um, and then, of course, we've got the wet berth area. So 
the the ratio of wet berth to dry storage in the marina is changing fundamentally, um, and the scale of boats that we can um, accommodate is increasing dramatically. So right now, the limited dry storage under roof on the site, I think, extends up to about six and a half or seven meters, which at the time was absolutely appropriate back in uh, the 60s when they built the place. The dry store will store up to 12 meter boats, uh, which is a which is a huge shift. And then the wet berths in the marina basin will go from um, 10 meters and above all the way up into that sort of 24 meter, the low end of what what's classified as super yachts, crude boats that are over 24 meters long. And I don't think we'll extend much beyond that, but the but the scope of being able to handle um, physically a lot more boat in there, I think, is you know, is a, is a huge benefit for the shoreline for boaters in general around Port Phillip and also for the marina. Thank you, John. And just looking at the next few questions, I think uh, will be for yourself or David. Uh, so I'll let you, uh, each of you decide who will answer which one. But the next question is from uh, the Elwood Angling Club. Um, would AMDC be interested in partnering with the club to promote fishing activities out of the marina, such as events, competitions, information sessions on fishing? And that ties into another question, which is, will platforms be constructed or areas outside for land-based fishing? Um, I'm just going to lean back behind the other panelists and have a quick uh, chat to David. I can't really do that here. Um, so the, so the, first, the first answer is, uh, we love to work with the uh, angling club. The part of uh, part of what we've um, arranged with the city is to make um, club space available for certainly for regular meetings and meeting spaces. Um, that is the first step in making clubs like that one feel like they've got a home um, that they can participate in. And initially, I think the way that we're thinking about that is really part of that Reva transformation. Um, and available space there, although at the center for boating, which is what we're calling the area at the north end of the dry stack, which David was talking about with space for members and families and chandlery and some service. And there um, adjacent to where the Coast Guard will be, there's space for accommodating there as well. So, I mean, we've got, we've, we've, we've started discussions with the Coast Guard around training sessions for boaters and skippers and uh, you know, people who may already have their boating license, but that, that want a little more practical real world experience and help when they're managing the boats as part of our concierge service, we'll be having people that can support people getting in and out of those those bays because um, you know, there is there is a, a you know wind effect and a whole lot of other things going on. So we've got a really strong focus on customer centric um, and working with clubs to to facilitate their programs and events. I mean, this is what the marina is all about. How do you get people down there to enjoy the place? Um, building fishing platforms, I don't think we've, uh, I think that's uh, something we've got to put into the uh, into the mix for the site design. I mean, I think there's almost certainly going to be uh, an extended range of great places where you can fish just because the site opens up right along that foreshore. I don't, uh, I don't, I don't, uh, I'm not a fisherman myself, so I don't really know what the requirements are for that, but, um, you know, not facing into the marina, that's just a hazard for everyone. But uh, but opening up that whole that whole foreshore really provides opportunities like that for everyone. David, do you have anything you want to add to that? No, John, I think you answered that correctly. And again, I think we're more than happy to get educated on exactly what people think would be a great idea. And uh, but I think the platforms depends on what happens with the with the you know the groins that we're proposing or discussing and whether we can get some sort of beach all the way along there. But we'd sort of, yeah, we're more than happy to understand exactly what, what requirements you're referring to in terms of platform because it's uh, we're not we're not allowed to uh, build any permanent fixtures out into the bay, I think from a legal requirement. So that'd have to be more Delp or Parks Victoria or something, I'm not quite sure. But uh, but yes, again, one of the questions we can look into. Thanks. And just to add to that, it's something if uh, if that was something that was um, desired and there was an interest, then you know we could also um, support those conversations with Delp and Parks Victoria about what was possible. Okay, so the next question. Can I just, is, on that one? I'd, I'd just say I also know that there's a tremendous, I mean, certainly around seasons like the snapper season, 
that there's a tremendous amount of boat-based traffic that uses the public ramp to get out and about there. So, look, it is a, it is a, um, there's a natural home here for clubs like that that um, that tie together events with um, with the fishermen, even on sh onshore or offshore, you know, in the water or from the land. So, look, I think it's a really exciting um, area for us to sort of explore and have thrown in the mix. Great, thank you. Okay, so a question about the dry stack. Uh, with 300 dry stack positions available, does this accommodate the current tenants, uh, i.e. all those in the racks and on trailers? I think you might have partially answered this already. Yeah, so um, it'll be very close. There's a, look, the, the transition from the wet berths is, uh, I think something like 120 to 150 berths in the water right now, and on land is a mix that is another 150 or so. So we're very close to matching the capacity with the 300 boat dry stack and the boats in water. So that so there'll be a mix of accommodating um, boats that can go into the dry stack and people that want to commercially go in there. Um, I think we should be able to accommodate everyone. John, I don't know because we're still waiting. Look, we've, we've, of all the current customers of the marina, we've got the ability to talk to about a third of them right now. And as um, those customers uh, keep uh, making contact with us through the current operators or through our own website, then, then we can get a gauge um, a better gauge of who wants to stay, who wants to move into the dry stack, who wants to stay and, and, and move out of the off the hard stand. Thanks, John. Just on the wet berth, there's, there's a question about uh, how the wet berth capacity will change with the new uh, redevelopment. Um, so how many in future versus uh, what's there now? Yeah, so it's about half. We're constrained. We're really constrained there by the um, uh, by the. Well, I'm not constrained. We, we've got the opportunity when we reconfigure to adhere to the AS3962, which is now a fixed standard, and so that dictates the width of fairways for the boats that you want to accommodate, and um, and all the um, boating research, market research work that we've done. Um, the feedback we've got from benchmarking other marinas says that there's more and more requirement for 15 metre plus boats. Um, and so we're accommodating all the way up. We're using the combination of the dry stack for smaller boats and the, and the wet berths for the larger boats, which is a shift because when the wet berth configuration was done originally, it was when common boat size was six and a half to eight metres. And so while we've got, we, we, we're roughly accommodating the same number of boats, we're designed to accommodate much bigger boats all the way up from the dry stack up to 12 metres through the uh, wet berths up to you know, 24 metres or so. Thanks, John. Uh, we've got a question about height and footprint of Bayside buildings and whether or not, or how will the heights and footprints of Bayside buildings change Will they be bigger or higher than the current building? So, Shelley, maybe you can talk, or Felicity, from a planning perspective, and then uh, maybe John or David could follow up talking about the uh, the, the idea around the Marine Parade um, strip, which I think is what is being referred to in the in the question. Shelley. Sorry, Joe, I was just going to um, clarify. Bayside means the water side or the marine parade side? Well, maybe just to be safe, uh, talk about the, the heights in general across the site and uh, how, they, uh, how they're different in the different zones and uh, compared to what's there now. Um, so, there's, so the planning control set maximum building heights for different areas of the site. So along um, marine parade it's a it's a minimum it's a maximum building height of 11 meters which includes all the roofs and everything like that um, in saying that you can see that the design that that um, John has come up with here it, they're only single story um, buildings so it'll be similar to kind of what's there already in terms of the building height um, it's just a different configuration of the buildings along there. And the planning controls, which which I understand this adheres to, 
basically says within that kind of um, section, you can only fill half of that space with buildings. So you couldn't have a single building that went the whole way along. Um, in terms of where the dry boat storage is, the maximum height there is up to 15 metres. Um, and then there is an allowance for some architectural features um, to come another three metres above that, as long as it doesn't exceed more than 20% of the, of the um, gross floor area. Um, so that is higher than what the existing dry boat storage um, buildings are at the moment. From memory, they're around 10 metres. Someone please correct me if I've got that wrong, 10 or 11 metres. Um, so, so that will be higher. Um, and then the Riva building, I'm understanding that's a, a renovation of the existing building. So it will be somewhat similar to what's there already. Thanks, Shelley. John or David, did you want to follow that up with um, maybe a, a bit about the intent of those spaces? Yes, yeah, cer certainly. So Marine Parade, um, as it's shown, is single story and um, our intention is to keep it like that, although you know within 11 metres you can you can fit a couple of stories, but the um, configuration we're still working through, the final configuration we're still working through internally and with the city on how best to group that retail space together to, to make it as vibrant, interactive and, and um, open and engaging as it can be. So I think the, the final look and feel will be slightly different, but it's certainly well within the planning scheme um, heights. Thanks, John. So we've got a question about transition for the site and uh, what will be uh, provide, how will the transition be managed around um, storage of boats as you move through the redevelopment? So who would like to answer that one? Well, I, I didn't have a go at that one too. <laughs> the, um, the, the, uh, I touched on it very quickly in my in my introduction. So the um, with the underlying philosophy that look we we want to keep the public boat ramp operating throughout, and that we want to keep our customers able to be out on the water throughout. The first phase is building the dry stack. And in order to do that, we've got to demolish what's existing. So we need to move anyone that's remaining on hard stand or current dry stack customer to the northern end of the peninsula so that we can manage their boats and we can still have construction going on at the dry stack. As soon as the dry stack is complete, we'll move those customers into the dry stack and we'll move in those customers in the wet berths that to elect to go into the dry stack so that we have at least minimised the number of, um, of uh, boats still in the water while we do the transformation of that space from anchoring on the marine parade side to anchoring on the peninsula side. And we're probably going to do that in two stages so that we can um, work around the movement of boats. There will be some juggling that has to happen. We'll be have a, an army of people moving as fast as they can to try and make it uh, as painless as possible for the customers, but we're thinking hard about that now. Um, everything else, I think, happens in an orderly fashion. So the restoration, renovation of um, of the Reefer building, the redevelopment of uh, Marine Parade, the the um, finalisation of the landscaping and the opening up of public areas, all can happen once we get the dry stack built and we can isolate the boating operations for that small footprint. Great, thanks, John. We've got a question about access for disabled people uh, to the water specifically, uh, but I think it's probably an opportunity to talk about the approach for access for all across the whole site, including um, to the water. And the comment uh, includes that there's challenges across other sites along the foreshore and um, great to have that thinking now into the site. Who, David or John? I'm happy to, and on the water side, thanks Joe. I mean, we uh, we already build in the code for all access there, for, so there won't be any issues. We're not having little gangways or little trip points or anything else. If there's smooth transitional plates from the from the land to the uh, very wide gangways and, and walkways, and there's, we've also got buggy services around the whole site. 
Um, so more or less from a water side that's being addressed uh, and it's all part of the Australian standards anyway. So it's it's all clearly defined in, in uh, the standards which John mentioned before. So um, we can, you know, we can circulate those as well. But yes, it's been completely addressed and there won't be any issues whatsoever. Great, thanks, David. OK, so the next question is about the car park and the foreshore, the vegetation um, that it looks like on the concept, uh, low lying shrubs and grasses. Is there an opportunity for larger trees for shade uh, and beauty, like Katani Gardens, for instance. John? So, yeah, I think the answer is there hasn't. Um, so, so the landscaping plans here, again, this is the concepts to um, to provide the basis for what we want to do moving forward. And in fact, uh, there's definitely been discussion about shade trees. I'm just, I can't quite tell from this picture that's up on the screen, but um, there are certainly there are certainly trees spread throughout the site for um, to provide shade. I mean, we haven't finalised it yet, but yeah, the answer is yes. Of course, there's there's plenty of room for shade, and in fact, there's a very strong focus on making sure that the um, native vegetation that we put across the site here ties in with the overall indigenous requirement for the area for for um, indigenous plantings that tie in with the salt bush and the particular other than the palm trees, of course, which are part of sort of a St Kilda heritage piece, but the particular native overlay of um, of plants and, and landscaping. Thanks, John. I think you've answered the next question, which was about will you include uh, native vegetation or is it just going to be all about the palms, uh, <laughs> which is that European feel of St Kilda? Yeah. Yeah, I think, look, I think the, there's some... Um, Pruning work to be done on the palms. They're, they're historical part of the site, but the uh, the primary focus is going to be on native vegetation and tying in with the rest of the foreshore. Great, thank you. Uh, I've got a question about planning for the Reaver site, and the question is uh, is about who who will be involved in the consortium, uh, or who will be involved in um, that re-envisioning of the, the food and beverage on the site? So, um, I'll, I'm not sure I, I understand the intent behind that question fully, but we're certainly doing a full plan for the um, renovation of Reva. The, the building itself was most recently significantly added to in the mid 90s with uh, something like 50 piles driven into the ground, a whole lot of steel and concrete work retaining the core structure. And so it is extremely solid and really just needs a, um, a refresh and a rethink around traffic flow and management, how the various spaces are used to make it the most exciting, vibrant and inviting for any of the guests to the site. So AMDC, is, we're doing that with our consultants and with our team and um, and working hard on how we program that in a way that really ties together as the social heart of the um, of the marina. It's a sensational location. The views out of every direction of that building are amazing. There's fantastic opportunity to engage um, in, in, in the western side when you don't have a um, gale force wind coming in, but uh, you know on the eastern side sheltering and looking into the into the marina basin. So the um, the opportunities there are endless, and part of our part of our challenge is to is to um, stop with the ideas and and really finalise how we're going to um, embody that. There's two floors. There's all sorts of areas where people can tie in. There's the opportunity to tie in with members to bring in public and have that that interface. So I mean, look, it's a really exciting site, and not to have to bulldoze it and rebuild it just means that um, you know, we can activate it so much more quickly. And, and have it functioning at about the same time that the dry stack's completed. Thanks, John. So the next question is about the petrol station site. And uh, the question is about what is planned uh, for the petrol station area, noting that, uh, well, noting that it potentially is heavily contaminated um, and what, what the future is for that site. Well, we, it'll remain as a fuel station for 10 years of the lease, Joe, as part of, I mean, that's a, a hard uh, target set by the um, 
uh, I think by uh, Delft. But anyway, there's a hard target there under our lease for that uh, to be a fuel station for 10 years. And then the transformation of that into something else, we're still working on what that might look like. Uh, I think under the development plan, we um, have to submit some ideas and certainly in the lead up through the RFP, the idea of transforming that into another logical extension of the marina with some retail and with some F&B and with something there that really engages and adds to the to the experience people have when they come on the site. We haven't refined it beyond there, but the contamination of the of what's under the ground, you know, the big operators like BP that are there now are very well experienced at um, managing that sort of thing. And you know, in the background, we're working very closely with the city on making sure the entire site is safe and and uh, for everyone. Thanks, John. And I might just note that a contamination assessment is underway at the moment um, to to map what is there and make sure that we're uh, taking that into consideration in the next next phase of development. So the next question is about the the sand area, and I note that it's not showed up here, but in the fly through we could see a bit of a strip of sand. So uh, David or John, could you maybe talk us through what the the intent is of that? You want, I'll, uh, do you want to have a go there, David? I, I mean, I can answer it. The, so, so Joe, one of the um, uh, particulars of the site is that the seawall that protects the reclaimed land all along that um, foreshore is in need of uh, repair and upgrade. And so as part of our uh, investigation into that and how we um, meet the specifications that have been provided, um, one of the groups that we spoke to uh, pointed out that uh, the uh, particularly progressive way of managing overtopping and wave action and um, degradation on an exposed shoreline like that is to return it to um, beach, sanded beach. So while it is not, um, we haven't gone through the uh, full uh, approval process yet with the city, it's certainly an aspiration and it seems to be an idea that would be tremendously beneficial to everyone to have that return to a, um, the natural state that it was before the land was reclaimed, which was a beach, which manages overtopping. It means that the uh, you get a fantastic amenity for a new amenity for the public. You um, and you actually um, provide a much more natural way of maintaining your shoreline. So, so I think we all got very excited about that. There's quite a lot of work to do with um, Parks uh, Vic and Delp and the city and with the maritime engineers to make sure that that is the most practical um, and appropriate way for us to manage that shoreline and to upgrade the seawall so that it'll be good through the future. But it, it was a really exciting development. So we've shown it in our, in some of our concept um, and the fly through vision. And, and we're really hoping that we can have at least some of that be expanded. Because of course, up the lighthouse uh, at the beacon end, there is a beach there that's that's present even in high tide and at low tide there is a you know lovely sanded area along here that really enhancing does a whole lot of good for the environment and for the public amenity. John, just to add to that as well, the the specialised coastal engineering marine firm that we've spoken to um, in detail that they said it's a common practice they've done in several areas now with Delp and uh, Parks Fix. So. It's not something new that we're doing, but it'd be great, a great asset for the site. It'd be fantastic, as you say. So hopefully, uh, hopefully that all goes well. Thanks, David and John. And, and uh, we do have a question here about provision for swimming, um, you know, possibly using a platform like for fishing, which was mentioned earlier in an earlier question. Uh, so is that something that you could see? I mean, we've already talked about the idea of a platform needing to be worked through uh, with Parks Vic and Delp, but uh, making the beach accessible for swimming and, and what else? David yeah, or John? Joe, I think the the, um, the uh, Great Port Phillip swimming pool um, hopefully will be dramatically more accessible if we're able to beach that area. So that's one of the tremendous benefits. and. I did mention earlier, we, we're thinking um, aspirationally or optimistically, if we are able to um, sand that area as part of remediating the seawall, it does open up all sorts of possibilities for little nippers of uh, engagement um, rather than just having 
you know, what is quite an aggressive barrier between the walking space and the water right now with a seawall where, you know, these are big rocks, these are, you know, these aren't things designed to be trafficked. Um, and so as part of the site master plan, we resolved that that can be beached. We, that also leads us to being able to do structures that provide access over that um, over that protective barrier onto the beach. And and so we've at least conceptually been starting to, to work through where would that be? How does that um, provide the best access? What points do you do it so that it gives the most engagement? And, and uh, it really opens up a lot of very exciting things for the public, right? Because that whole area right now is chained off, and and um, when we're when we open up the site, that whole waterfront becomes public access. So so I think that we haven't focused too much on um, thinking about a swimming pool on the in the hard stand of the area, or even within the uh, within the marina basin, because the beach area is is such a big attractor, and a, and just a fantastic opportunity if we can make it accessible and beneficial for the site. Thanks, John. Uh, I've got a quick question about whether or not the lighthouse is operational and could that structure be used? Who can well, answer so, that? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, um, it's not a lighthouse, Joe. It's, a, uh, it's just a, it's a, it's a beacon that has um, lights on it, but it's not, a, not an official way station for navigation. I think it's used as a landmark for that, but it's um, it's it's uh, dare I say ornamental. It's um, yeah. I'm yeah, happy for it. Jelly, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you know. I think ornamental is a good word for it. Uh, yeah. It does have. Uh, Shelley, correct me if I'm wrong. Or for city, it's got heritage significance. Yeah. I think Maurice Morris um, from the uh, Coast Guard could probably give us. Uh, a more official review of, of what the beacon's good for. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So now I've got a question about the bridge uh, and noting that the community, there's, you know, there's uh, the community, well, it says community and council, but I would say that there's been some strong feelings for the bridge um, by people, but there's also been some strong concerns raised. And uh, so this question really is about um, that some boat owners are concerned and, and asking well, what what is the position of or what are the, the thoughts of about the bridge for AMDC? John, do you want me to uh, touch on that one? Look, fr from our point, of course, we, uh, our specialist uh, marine engineers raised some really relevant concerns about putting a, uh, a, a bridge there, but obviously taking costs aside, I mean, there are, you can put a bridge, as many bridges on marinas, but it'd be obviously quite a costly exercise to be able to make sure that it's completely functional and safe for, for boating as well as for pedestrians. So, I mean, there's a lot of work would have to go into it. And we agreed that we would, you know, work with, uh, work with the city, you know, uh, about, you know, if you, if there was a desire later on, of, of, well, what best from a marine coastal operational point of view, um, but, you know, it's certainly, um, you know, there has to take a lot of considerations in. Thanks, David. And I would just say, uh, add to that also that, you know, the, the ability for a bridge to be um, developed later has been built into the, the lease agreement and uh, so it can be developed in future but any proposal for a bridge would have to take into consideration the function of the marina and make sure that it's accommodating all of the users of that site as well um, so that there would be a lot of work involved in in uh, the planning for a bridge and obviously consultation as well um, so while it's contemplated in the lease that a future bridge um, needs to be accommodated for. At the moment, there's no um, there's no plan to pursue that currently. Okay, so uh, we've got a question about what hours will the dry stack operate? Hopefully a straightforward question there for you, David or John. Or maybe not, you might be still thinking I, uh, about it. <laughs> I haven't. Yeah, still thinking about it. I haven't. Uh, it'll it'll operate the uh, hours that are necessary to keep our customers happy. I think uh, I don't know whether that's five till uh, five till five till midnight or um, 
what those are. David's probably got more experience um, operating and being part of these than I have, but it's you know we, we're very customer focused, and I think that uh, I'm expecting that the hours will be long. Yeah, and, and, and as you said, John, in different seasons, whether it be the snapper fishing season or other things, we'll work with, with everyone to see what exactly their requirements are. But of course, it will be set hours. It's not 24-7, uh, even though it's uh, uh, it, it will have some downtime. But but we, as I said, we'll work with everyone on, on what's, what's appropriate. Thanks, David and John. So I've got a question about the type of integrated water management features that are being planned for and particularly the filtering of stormwater and the improvement of stormwater outfalls in light of sea level rise. Who would like to have a go at that question? I'm happy to have a little go at that one too, John. I'll let you off a little bit. The, um, Again, with our infrastructure consultants have been looking at it, a lot of the time with the storm water now, they have what they call gross pollutant traps. And a lot of these will then can, you know, capture any of the any of the rubbish and can be easily maintained from us so we don't have any uh, adverse effects to the environment. Um, so there's a lot of new technologies and, and uh, that are out there now. So we're going to apply those. Obviously, when this was originally built, they didn't have any of these technologies. So fortunate now, everything we're doing from whether it be water-based or landside based, we're, we're um, putting in the in the best measures and the latest uh, practice or technology to adopt uh, uh, adopt the best practice. So yeah, and that's also part of our our overall plan, whether it be on the land or in the water. We uh, part of our um, submission for winning a five star anchoring thing is also addressing the environment. So yeah, I hope that answers the question. Thanks, David. So I've got a question about how long the construction process will take and what the hours or days per week would be for construction. So moving into out of planning into construction, thinking into the future. Yeah, okay. I think that Joe, the, the um, I mentioned in my preamble that we're going to work very hard to keep the transformation of the site to under two years from when we get started, the main parts of it. And I think I don't think we're anticipating anything beyond a normal um, workday week. The the benefit that we've got is that um, the dry stack and the wet berth, a lot of the um, hard work on those constructions get gets done off site. So they're actually relatively quick and painless to put up. They're, they're, you, we can't avoid the civil works, but again, we've got a very light touch civil works program that isn't about doing huge amounts of excavation. Um, and so we're going to have to, I mean, we're very conscious of timing that around um, being on the fringes of active, you know, suburban or well, urban areas where people are living. And I think that, you know, that's just part of good practice for, the, for what we're implementing. Thanks, John. We've got a, a comment and a question. So a comment about um, a previous submission about impacts to rigging, de-rigging, launching and retrieving trailable sail boats and concern about the lack of rigging and loss of pontoons and uh, a request to meet uh, to discuss those things. So maybe you could um, either David or Johnny could talk about um, those concerns, but also uh, the request to meet and, and whether that's a possibility for anybody who would like to. So I think I think the, the one of the parts that I'll pick out in there, Joe, that I just want to address straight off the bat is the um, the rigging pontoons. So I think in an earlier iteration, the designer just showed that there was the pontoon on the um, on the reaver side of the boat ramp wasn't included. So I mean that's uh, that was just an omission. I think you know the the pontoon access once boats are in the water to be able to do that on the on the anything but the peninsular edge of the marina is all being opened up to public berthing, and so to the extent that that's not full for people visiting coming, I mean there'll be a certain part of that as people um, float float their boats off the public boat ramp and prepare to depart. Uh, that's all a, a new access an amenity that's available to users of that ramp that's never been available before. The second is for space for rigging. One of the um, quirks right now of the, of the system that's in place is that if you pass through into the parking area, you have to pay. And then as you leave, 
that's not kept a record of. And so it, it detracts from being able to take extra time to rig the boats. Because I think, you know, trailer sailors will take 30 to 60 minutes to get rigged and ready for, for um, putting in the water. And so with the with digital tech the way it is now, you can have a program where you go in and out through those gates as many times as you want, still under the one program. And so I think, look, I think the traffic flow and the work, uh, we still have to do some final refinement of that. Um, will improve the ability to manage mast up trailer sailors alongside, for instance, the easiest uh, delivery is a jet ski where you, I mean, it takes, you know, minutes to get it into the water. And so, and so we're well aware of that. And of course, we're willing to meet and, and talk about those as we get closer to, um, closer to configuration and, and finalizing the way that the um, traffic patterns flow. I think what's important is that through the Have You Say, website that we capture these and the mast up trailer sailors have been in you know very vocal throughout the process so we're we're um aware of the need to have a conversation with them to see what we can do and what's possible and i think it's just a matter of getting close to the time when we've got an op our operational team in place that we that we can really um give that the best attention Thanks, John. And um, we've got five minutes, well, four minutes left now, and I'm going to see if we can get the last two questions in really quickly. Uh, we'll see how we go. So I might ask you, John, to answer both of these if you can. One is about the dry stack storage fee structure um, and uh, you know, how, I guess, managing the uncertainty in this transition period. Um, of what that might be in the future and also about car parking and the fact that as it becomes a greater attraction for many people, uh, what kind of car parking might we make available to people, particularly noting that public transport is an issue. So uh, two minute answer and then I'll wrap up. Yeah, so two minute answer very quickly. The fee structure we haven't finalised yet, but the fee structure for marinas around the bay is pretty public um, based on length of boats and the level of service provided. We're intending to um, have membership structure for members of the, the uh, customers and members that are in the wet berths, that are in the dry stack, that want to just be non-boating members, uh, which was an earlier question. And so we're not expecting that to be out of line with um, the rest of our commercial competitors. Uh, and the communication of that will happen first to the customers as we work, the current customers of the marina as we work through the way we're putting that together. Um, the second part around the car park, look, it, it's a very high quality problem to have, to have the marina transform and be extremely exciting to everyone. We all know that the use of cars to come to events is reducing. We've got some constraints. I mean, we're significantly constrained on the land by how many car parks we can have. And one of the ways that we're addressing that to make a, a good blend between um, boat and trailer parking versus public for certain events is having this reconfigurable car park, which is which is pretty straightforward given the technology we're putting in place. So being able to carve out parts of it for markets and uh, events like sporting events, but also being able to carve off part of it for specific car only uh, uh, use at certain times. I mean, I think that's the sophistication that comes with redeveloping the site is that we can be as good as we can be about managing that as possible given the constraints of the site. Thanks, John. Very succinct answer. Uh, David, just before we wrap up, is there any final thoughts from you? I think John covered that uh, well, but I th look, the reality is, uh, as John said, it's very, very public in terms of the fees. We, we don't see much change uh, for any of the uh, current uh, existing uh, boat owners. So, but again, we, we have been, we're going to have a build a permanent presence at the marina in the, in the coming weeks. So I welcome anyone if they want to just come down to the office, make an appointment or just walk in and, and see any of us and we can run through all those questions and clarify for them, uh, uh, which our door will always be open. I say we'll be full, full manned down there, um, I think within the next two weeks. So welcome everyone to come uh, down to the marina and meet all the other owners or directors and, and uh, speak with John and myself and we can, we can address those further if they want to. Thanks, David. And you also have the website that has contact details as well, which is great. So uh, that's all we have time for. Thank you very much, everybody, uh, for you. your attendance today. And thank you to everybody who's participated in the panel. Uh, your feedback will be collated and given to Council for, from the Have Your Say page, um, which is 
a really important input into the planning process moving forward. So thank you all again uh, for giving up your time on a Sunday morning and uh, have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, everyone.